morning. morning. We're going to take our psalm books. We're going to turn to page 362. I am thine, O Lord. I'll ask all those who are able to stand. Page 362. Thank you. <laughs> what the announcements today have a lot of been canceled because if you see, until further notice, uh, Larry's going to go over. Pastor Larry will be going over this more, but there's going to be some things canceled in our church. Uh, as you can see, no Sunday morning services, nursery will be available. No Sunday school, no church, children church, no evening service, no Wednesday night evening service, and all of us you know why because of the coronavirus. And we're we're taking a positive step towards this. Um, we put uh, uh, hand, hand sanitizers outside, so we're doing all we possibly can to protect you and your family from the coronavirus. So uh, as far as we have one announcement, which means Uncle Sam needs you. No, we need you, okay? Um, there's going to be a table set up, not this Sunday, but next Sunday, but a table set up next week in the lobby back there. Uh, if you've never had your picture put in the church directory, uh, that's what it's for. To sign up to put your picture and your address. Or if you have changes to make, if you have a different phone number or different address, do that this next Sunday as well. There'll be a table set up back there. Also, for those of you who aren't on one call, you're missing an opportunity because you might show up church service one of these days and we won't be here because everybody else got a one call saying there was no service and you didn't get that. So one call is vital. So make sure if you haven't signed up for one call, there's going to be a table set up in the lobby and all you got to do is go to the table uh, and sign up for, for the one call. So church director and one call, it'll all be back here. As you, and also I think it was up a while ago about the, uh, the hand sanitizers. We're going to be doing that. So um, there it is again. They went away, okay? So you can see different things have been canceled. So keep those in mind. Uh, we're, we have your best interest in heart because uh, uh, no matter what you think about what the cause of this is, uh, it's still real as far as us taking care of you, okay? 
High schoolers, attention high school and college graduates, sign up today for the Welcome Center for a Bible or a Bible Dictionary. That's going to be signed up before April 19th because May 17th is when we're going to recognize all the graduates. So keep make sure you, you do that as well, okay? Okay. Now, while I've got the platform, it's a good time for me because I am your missions director. <clears throat> so on your envelopes, which you'll find in the back of the pews, it has a place here for you actually to give a weekly offering and also a spatial offering. If you would, okay, this is important because we talk about missions and how we can't go on foreign fields, but we can support them on foreign fields. It's important. They need the support, spatial, spatial needs. So put on here um, for missions, however much you decide to give, but please give to missions because the fact is we do support a lot of missionaries not only here and not only across the world, but also here in the United States as well where missionaries are at. One more thing as far as us being missionaries here in the United States is back in the back, there's a track rack, okay? You can pass these out. This one around here is one of my favorite ones uh, that you can pass out at restaurants. It says, thank you. Inside what it does, it talks about the service of the persons performed. It tells them how to be saved, okay? And our job is to tell others how to be saved. Sometimes we don't make personal contact with people, but we can leave a track like this and tell people how to be saved. So it's important in restaurants or wherever you come in contact with people to actually give them the track. Those are back there in the vestibule, that in the foyer, uh, right as you go out the door. So make sure you can grab as many as you want. We'll buy more if we need to buy more, but get as many as you want and as many as you need because the fact is we need to get the gospel out. Thank you. Good to see you, both of you here this morning. I truly understand there are some people, especially our elderly, that may choose not to be here and others for that matter. Um, the world, not just the United States and not just Monroe County, are faced with this coronavirus. And whether or not, whatever you think about it, our responsibility here is to try to keep you as safe as we possibly can. So you may have noticed at each entrance to the sanctuary, there are hand sanitizers. We encourage the use of those. We discourage handshaking from here on out for a while. Verbal greetings are nice. Elbow bumps are nice. I've seen people jumping in the air and kicking feet. I don't know that I would suggest that, certainly not for me, but uh, however you choose to greet people, do it in a manner that would keep us all safe, and uh, please keep in mind that uh, until further notice, we are going to have Sunday morning church and nursery only. All other services are put on hold for a while until we see what's going on with this virus. Now, Bob talked to you about one call. You don't have to be a member here to be on one call. <coughs> Excuse me. If you, if you attend, I'm supposed to do this, aren't I? If you attend here at Lakeside at all, um, we may need to get a message to you rather quickly, and that's what one call is. We make one call, and it goes out to everybody that's on that list. Uh, beginning next Sunday, there'll be a table set up for that and for pictures to be taken so that you can get on the directory. Again, you don't have to be a member. One call is extremely important to me. Now, we're hopefully we're past the, uh, the stage where weather would probably prohibit us from meeting. But there, with this virus, there may be messages that I need to get out to you quickly, and one call is the best way for us to do that. So please, I beg you, please take a moment, either on the way in next Sunday or on when you can do it this Sunday. Uh, there's sign-up sheets at the Welcome Center. But next Sunday, we're going to have a special table for that purpose. Uh, please keep in mind that in order for us to be good neighbors to one another, um, as I said earlier, we're going to refrain from shaking hands, hugging necks for the next little bit. Uh, I would encourage you to everybody to use a hand sanitizer before you enter the sanctuary, and uh, that will ensure 
as much as possible that we are taking care of you folks. Anything else that we need to do to make you more comfortable, we're attempting to do. Now, for those of you that have children in Awana, Andrea Thomas has graciously uh, committed to coming here to church herself, and she's going to do a live presentation at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays that you can view on our YouTube. So all you have to do is go to Lakeside MBC, Missionary Baptist Church, uh, on, uh, what's that called, YouTube, and you'll be able to link in with that uh, live presentation. So if you have kids, that will eliminate the need for the kids to come together, and at the same time, it will give them something uh, to do over this, uh, what, what are you all off, three weeks, four weeks? Three weeks? Okay. That's a long time to be off, isn't it? And I'm sure your hearts are broken. And uh, I'm sure you'll be diligently doing your, your studies while you're off. But uh, let's do this as a church. Let's be safe. Let's be conscientious of one another. And let's try our very best to uh, help other people in a time like this can really show them the love of Christ. So I thank you for listening to that. I know it's been kind of lengthy, but uh, if you'll all just help us work together, uh, we'll get through this at some point, and uh, we can get back to having the services that we typically have. Thank you. We're going to cancel the memory verse every Sunday, too, because I can never remember it. <laughs> I'm pitiful. I'm telling you, I really am. Yeah. Let's stand for this. I always like to honor the word of God, and I'm sure you do too. As we typically do, we'll recite the scripture where it's found. We'll recite the verse together, and then we'll recite where it's found. But as I tell you each and every time that I remember to do this, it's not just for right now. This needs to go in our head make its way to our heart and and we need to be able to draw this up at times when we need it and that's the purpose of memorization of scripture how many of you have have memorized every scripture that we've been putting up for the last year or so may I see your hand every single one of them wow I was going to offer a hundred dollars but I'm not because he already said he was <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful if we'd all put those in our mind and in our heart? Let's do this together. Isaiah, Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. Amen. Let's remain standard, if you will. We're going to sing this morning, Oh, come to the altar.
Good morning. It's good to see you all in the Lord's house today. You know, there's many times in my life that I have struggled and failed God, but unless, guess what? The altar is always open. God doesn't close for business. God never puts a I'm not here sign up at his window. He's always there for me in my time of need, and he is worthy of that praise that we give him. You know, praise and worship, that word worship comes from the word worth. Well, if I look at something that has worth, then it has value. Well, friend, the value of worship doesn't just come from raising a hand. It's not just from making some type of manufactured motion. It comes from showing value for what we have. And that value is priceless of what God has given you. See, worship isn't just, hey, somebody's looking at me and I've got some emotions going on. No, it's us giving that, showing that worth and giving it back to God because he's given us something that we could never pay for. We can't put a price for what he's given us. And that sweet, precious gift that he gave us was his blood. And friend, we are very honored and happy to have you here today. If you're visiting with us, we're honored that you would choose to come to this worship house with us. Pray that something would be said and done that would bless you, help you get through this week. Uh, Pastor already beat me to the punch, so I don't have to do the memory verse and mess that up. But I do find that Our memory verses, I don't know who puts them together, it's not me, but it always seems to strike a chord with what's going on in our lives. See, the spirit of fear is something that's overwhelming. You know, they say almost 90% of things that we fear never actually happen. But when we think about it, it's troubling. And fear is a great monster in a lot of people's lives. And what's going on in our world today? Yes, we need to be logical. We need to take precautions and we need to be prepared. But friend, whatever happens in this world, God's still in control. God didn't wake up today and say, oh my goodness, what's going on in this world? No, he knows right what's happening. I'm still right in the palm of his hand. He's never left me. He's never forsaken me. And the Bible says that I don't have to fear. And I can trust in him. Because it says that we were not given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that, friend, can overcome any fear that I have in my life. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, I trust and pray that we would bow our hearts, honor our minds, and that we would get ourselves prepared for what God has for us today. Our precious Father, we thank you for the gracious opportunity we have to gather together in your house. Father, we know the circumstances of this world are far beyond our control. Father, I pray that we could keep our hearts in tune with you, that we would follow your precious Holy Spirit. We wouldn't let the times of this world be a dampening effect to what your Spirit has prepared for our hearts today. Father, I pray that you'd be with our pastor, that you would give him strength and give him words that only you can provide, that your Holy Spirit would walk the aisles of this place today, and that we would leave here a changed people, and that we would have a further desire to follow you in our lives. Father, I pray for those that are among us today, that they have not yet made that step of faith and trusted in you as their Savior. Oh, Father, that you could give them such conviction on their hearts that they would understand the precious need that they have for you and for you this and for your word. And Father, we'll be careful and give you the praise and honor for everything that's said and done and all of God's people said, amen. Every 
You ought to rename it to Hallelujah Boogie. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to praise the Lord? And he certainly is worthy. Amen. And listen to what the Bible said. He inhabits the praise of his children. And however you choose to worship him, that's entirely up to you. But he inhabits the praise of his children. Sings more of that. That's pretty good. <laughs> if you're not familiar with it, is for Children's Church. This will be our last Sunday for Children's Church for a little bit, but we will have nursery. So if you've got a child that's of nursery age, we'd encourage you to, to come. Um, even if you don't want to put them in the nursery, if you want to put them in here, that's fine. Uh, we never have been strict on that, telling you what you have to do. I've always said if I couldn't out holler a kid, I'd quit. So uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the 23rd chapter of the book of St. Luke, Luke 23. When you found that, if you're able, would you stand with us out of respect for God's word?
What I'm about to read in our hearing, Jesus is on the cross. And there are two men on either side of him. And the scripture that I'm about to read is a conversation between these two men and Jesus. So if you'll start with me in Luke chapter 23 and in verse 37. Let's back up to verse 36. That might give us a little bit better launching into this. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Notice that these words now are in capital letters. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Thank you. You may be seated. I would draw your attention, I don't always use slides, but I really felt inclined to do so this week. And I want you to think about these three statements that are up there. Three men, three crosses, and three relationships to sin. Three men, three crosses, and three relationships to sin. Now, the first one that I'd like to bring to our attention is the man on the middle cross. Obviously, that's Jesus. And the scripture, and Jason has been so gracious to help me on many occasions, and these slides he's put together for us. And I'd like for you to just take a moment and read all of those words that are at the bottom there. Because when Jesus died for sin, he died for every sin. And if you'll stop up for a moment, and, and this is not an exhaustive list. There are things that are not listed there. But I want you to stop for just a moment. Take maybe 30 seconds without me saying anything and read that list. So on the middle cross is a man by the name of Jesus. He has walked the shores of Galilee. He has healed the sick. He has caused the blind to see. He has stopped deaf ears. He has unstopped deaf ears. He has caused the lame to walk again. He's caused those that couldn't speak to be able to do so. And on a few occasions, he's even raised the dead. And yet, 
He's hung on a cross. But I want you to stop and think about this man. This was his purpose in coming to this world. They didn't catch Jesus off guard and crucify him. They didn't cause the Son of God to be tricked into doing something that they could crucify him for. He was destined for this cross from the very foundation of the world. And so if you'll stop and think for just a few minutes, the purpose of him coming, he said, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. And folks, every single one of us fell into that category. Every single one of us is lost at some point in time. And some point in time, the Holy Spirit, who is also God, he's just as much God as God the Father is. He's just as much God as God the Son is. He is God, but he has a little bit different role to play. And his role it primarily is to convict. The word convict means to convince. So at some point in time in every person's life, the Holy Spirit chooses to convince us of our need of salvation. Every single one of us is in need of being saved. We are all destined from the very beginning of our life at some point in time we are going to realize that we are sinners and that nothing we can do will ever cause us to gain heaven. What we need to understand is that God Almighty had prepared a way from the very foundation of the world. Before time as we know it, in the mind of Almighty God, God said, I'm going to create man, I'm going to give him a help meet, and I'm going to allow them to have offspring. And I'm going to replenish this earth. And in those people that are a part of the human race, I'm going to give Adam and Eve, their forefathers, perfection. I'm going to place them in a place called the Garden of Eden. And in that garden, they are perfect. The Bible said, naked and not ashamed. The nakedness says to you and I that they were innocent and in innocency they lived for a period of time. But then Satan came along and tempted Eve and she gave to her husband and sin entered the human race. And because of that sin, the Bible said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what that scripture really means, in the Greek language, if you study it much, you'll find that it's a picturesque language. It has a great deal to do with trying to paint pictures. Uh, a person paid me a compliment years and years ago and that person said, in your preaching, it's as if you draw us a picture and allow us to see what's the words that are coming out of your mouth. And that's what I'd like to do this morning. If you would understand for just a moment, a target, a target, a bullseye. And if you have a bow and arrow and you pull the arrow back on the bow, the attempt is to get to the center of the target, the bullseye. But the scripture that I just quoted to us said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, when we shoot our lives toward God, our arrow falls short. There's no way we come up to the standard of God. And the only way we can come up to that standard is to come into somebody who is that standard and that somebody is Jesus. And so when we believe and trust in him, we come into the righteousness of almighty God. We come into the right standing before the Lord. I've said this on many occasions and it's true. When Calvary took place, Jesus said the purpose for me coming into this world because man was consigned to death. But the purpose of me coming as a man was to take those people's place, all of us, to take our place on the cross. And so when Jesus 
was going to the cross, here's what he promised us. He said, on the cross, I'll make an exchange with you. I will give you my righteousness and in turn, I will take your sin. Now, does anybody think we got the raw end of that deal? We got the best end of that deal, did we not? His righteousness, the Bible teaches us, was imputed to us. That's an accounting term. When you impute to someone's account, you're charging it to that account. His righteousness in all of my sin and all of your sin was his righteousness took the place of our sin, imputed to our account, count it to their side of the ledger and give me their sin. In just a little bit, you're going to hear about the darkness that fell while Jesus was on the cross. And I'm going to tell you how I think it pertains to this sin that I'm talking about. But here is the son of the living God dying for sin. I want you to log that in your mind. He's dying for sin. He's dying for my sin. He died for your sin. He died for the sin of the entire world. The Bible said, for God so loved the world that he gave. True love is giving, folks. True love is not just words that escape our lips. But true love is giving of our lives. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So this man that's on the center cross, he's got a mission. And he's just about ready to fulfill this mission. And now he's got two thieves on either side of him. I want you to notice the Bible calls them both malefactors. The reason I think the Bible puts them in the same category is that all of us are in the same category. We're all sinners in the sight of God. Now that doesn't sound right to a lot of people and that doesn't sound nice to a lot of people, but I'm here to tell you today, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, we're consigned to death. All of us are going to meet death one day physically, but we don't have to meet it spiritually if we place our faith and our trust in the Son of God. So there he is, dying for sin. But then there's a man who's dying to sin. And there's another man that's dying in sin. I want to start with this man first. This man is hanging, I believe, to the left of Jesus. And the man that's dying to sin is to the right of Jesus. Now, I, I base that on several scriptures that talk about Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That was a place of power. That was a place of authority. So in my surmising, I believe the man who's dying in sin is on the left of Jesus. And if you could just imagine for a minute, this man is facing the same death as these two men here. But this man looks to Jesus and he says, if you're really who you say you are, get yourself down from here and get us down with you. Had Jesus listened to him and had Jesus done what he requested, three people would have been saved from physical death that day only to die again somewhere down the road, right? So here, this man says, save us. He's only thinking of the now. He's only thinking of the temporary. And what we need to understand, folks, is that our life here on earth is temporary. As, as old as you might get, you probably, probably none of us or very, very, very few of us would ever reach 100 years old. In the scope of eternity, it's less than a snap of the finger. In the scope of eternity, it's really nothing. But think about this man. This man is looking at the son of the living God and evidently doesn't realize in whom presence he's in. 
And he says, get us down from here. Get us off of this cross because you see, I want to live in the physical. But I just said to us, our physical won't last a long time. Our physical won't last a long time. But there's two of you in every seat. There's what you can see and there's a person you can't see. And the person you can't see is going to live somewhere forever and ever and ever. And you get to make the choice. The plan of salvation is already laid out for you. God sent his only son that he might die in our place, that he might take our sins upon him, that he might give us his righteousness when you and I that are saved by the grace of God When we stand before Almighty God, we don't stand in our own good works. We don't stand in our own righteousness. We don't stand in our our own ability to say, I'm going to make it to heaven. We stand in the righteousness of Almighty God. Yet this man says, save us three. Get us down from here. Now let me back up one slide. Heaven help us. Get me back to to the other one. Thank you. Dying to sin was this man. This man looks at Jesus and he's just heard what the other man said. And as he listens to what this other man says, he rebukes him and he says to him, don't you realize that we're in the same condemnation? Don't you realize that what we receive, we receive justly? We've sinned. We've committed error in the the eyes of the, the authorities of the land. But this man's done nothing wrong. I believe what he was really saying was, this man is the son of God. This man is perfect. This man, one scripture tells us, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That really means this, Jesus, the reason that you and I can trust in him to take us to heaven is that he never sinned a moment while here on earth. Not one moment. People say, well, now wait a minute. What about the cross? What about uh, the wilderness? Did he have the capability of sinning? Not according to what I understand in the scripture because you see, if you define sin... It's the complete opposite of what Jesus was. Complete opposite. So this man says to him, Lord, when you enter into your kingdom, would you remember me? And Jesus turns to him and says, this day, listen to me if you've never been saved. It's not a progressive process. It's an instantaneous something that happens in the life of a person when they become a believer and believe against all odds. The Bible said we are saved that very moment. Remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus says, today, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, I've done a lot of studying on paradise. And there's a lot of different beliefs about where paradise was. The best I can come up with, it may have just been another name for heaven. But no matter what it's called, listen to the promise that Jesus gave this man. Today, right now, When you close your eyes in death, you're going to be with me. Matters not where I am, you're going to be with me. Theologians can argue it. Theologians can surmise it. Theologians can say, I wonder where paradise was. It doesn't matter. If you're going to be with Jesus, it's okay. Isn't it? It's all right. Wherever he is. 
I've had people argue me, if heaven is up, where was it for China? Because they're on the opposite end of the earth. How could it be up for them? That doesn't make any sense to me, but I've had that argued to me by several different people. Let me tell you something. I don't know exactly where heaven is. Neither do you. But I know one thing, God's there. And Jesus is there and he's on the right hand of the Father and he's there for your sake. If you've never been saved, he is there. If you will plead your case, he will plead it to the Father and you can be saved by the marvelous grace of God. I don't suspect any of us in here big shots. I'm certainly not. But I still get to go to heaven because I placed my faith and my trust in the biggest shot that ever walked the face of the earth. Amen. And that's Jesus. They rejected him. They laughed at him. They scorned him. They mocked him. They criticized him. They were cruel to him. They plucked his beard. They hit him. They put a, a cat of nine tails on him. They, they did everything they could. They put him on a cross. And on that cross, he looks out over the people and he says to his father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't recognize that this was your plan from the inception of the world. And so, here's this man. And this man says, remember me. So he's dying. That man died in his sin. And he's just as sure in hell today as I'm standing before you. But this man died to his sin by believing and trusting in the precious name of Jesus. Do I understand all of this? I'm a far shot from understanding this. But there's parts of it that I understand. And one of them is, for God so loved Larry that he gave Jesus that I might have life and have it abundantly. So this man is dying to his sin and he gets to go to be where Jesus is. Now, prior to this, and I don't want to get too theological with you, but prior to this, nobody went to heaven because the way had not been made. But the scripture says here, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Now, you've heard me preach on this a dozen and dozens of times, but if you could imagine in that opening right there, a big curtain, and if you could imagine that it being all one seam, and could you imagine me trying to get in the middle and ripping it open, it would be an impossibility. Some estimate that the thickness of that was six to nine inches, and there was no seam in it whatsoever. But just think for a moment. When this conversation was going on, just after it took place, when Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple was rent. That means it was torn in two from the top to the bottom. That means that God opened access into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies represents heaven itself. So you and I that choose to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we have instantaneous access to heaven itself. Amen. Isn't that wonderful to think about? And you don't have to wait till you die to have access there. He's wanting to hear from you. Prayer is the most glorious of opportunities that we have as a child of God. We can talk directly to God the Father. We can talk to Jesus. We can talk to the Holy Spirit. Some people say, oh, you should only talk. You talk to whoever you want to. I'm talking to all three of them. Because <laughs> sometimes I need the power and the strength of the Spirit in my life. And if he's just as much God, why can't I talk to him? 
And I wonder today, the veil of the temple is rent in twain and Jesus gives up the ghost. Now I want to share three things with you in closing. I want you to look at this depiction here. To the left of Jesus is dying in his sin. He's dying to his sin and he's dying for the sin of both of them and all of us. And here's the thought I want to leave with you in closing. Three crosses. This man is on the cross of rebellion. I'm not going to accept I'm not going to believe and I'm going to say something that may shock you but you have every right to die and not go to heaven. I've never read anywhere where Jesus would run you down to save you. I had a person tell me they did. He did one time. I don't believe a word of it. Listen to me. You have every right. Every one of us is in this state of rebellion at one time or another. And you have every right to stay there if you choose to. That's up to you. But if you look at this man, this man wasn't in rebellion. This man was in repentance. This man turned from his sin. That's what repent means. It means to recognize that there's something better. Now, this conversation that I'm having with you right now would be different if you were lying on a bed and had gotten the prognosis from a doctor that you'll never see the light of day again. By tomorrow morning, you will have entered eternity it would have much more impact on you because sometimes when we sit in a venue like this, when we think about what I'm saying to you, we always think about it being the other person. Or even if we think about it being us, we think about it somewhere down the road. Let me just use this virus thing for, for an illustration. One moment, nothing. The next moment, chaos. Chaos. The next moment, people are dying. And folks, if I understand the scripture correctly, every single one of us is headed for death. Amen. We're going to die. But it is yet to be determined if we're going to die in our sin or we're going to die to our sin. The choice is really yours. Because the man in the middle, if this was rebellion and this man died in repentance, then this man died in redemption. He has redeemed every single one of us. And all that remains are for you to claim that redemption. That's all that remains to have the peace and the comfort in your heart of knowing. I just had a test here a while back where they inserted something down my throat to look at the backside of my heart to determine if there was something there that caused the stroke that I had. And they positioned me on this table they turned me a little like this and I could see a man standing, one well, a doctor standing over there with an instrument with a hose on it about that long. And I knew that hose was going down my throat. And was I scared? No. Because I had prayed before I had ever gone there and while I was there and before they put me to sleep, I just said, God, I'm in your hands. And if I know anything about you, Lord, you said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. 
And folks, I don't want to get morbid here with you. But based on my health issues, it won't be a long time till I'm laying here. And when I lay here, I want you to know something. That's just what I'm leaving behind. Amen. The real Larry will have escaped this and gone to the very presence of God Almighty when Jesus comes to get me. And I don't know about you. I don't want to die. I love my family. I love you. I want to stay around as long as I can. But I am not afraid to die. I dread death. It's got a sting to it, according to the scripture. But oh, precious friend, when you see me lie here, you can say but one thing, I trust and pray. He went to where he's preached about all these years. Amen. I'm going home, folks. And probably sooner than later. And I'm not trying to say that to, you know, to make you feel bad. Every time I say that, Terry tells me, don't, don't talk like that in church because everybody comes to him and all the other deacons, his pastor dying. Is he? <laughs> yeah, I am. So are you. You're dying too. And you may beat me. You may be, have the healthiest heartbeat that's here this morning, but you may beat me to eternity. So which cross are you going to be on today? The center cross says life, life here and life everlasting. This cross says, I'm only thinking about now, but this cross says, I want to make preparation. I want to go where Jesus is going. That man had no idea where paradise was. That man had no idea what was on the other side of the last breath he was about to take. But he knew one thing. Wherever this man goes, I want to go with him. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. To know that, that you and I who are nobodies, when you die, when I die, we're going to get a little paragraph in the Monroe paper, about this long and about like that. And it'll have your name up at the top and it'll tell whatever you did. And if you want more than that, you've got to pay for it. Isn't that something? You've got to pay for it. What I'm talking about has already been paid for. Amen. Jesus paid for it at the cross. Stand with me if you would. With your heads bowed, please. Before you bow your heads, in a few weeks, our security folks are going to talk to you. And they've asked me to convey to you that this is section one, two, three, and four. Okay? So if I start using that terminology, you know what I'm talking about. So now if you'd bow your heads with me for just a few minutes, I'll start in section number one. What cross are, were you on? Now you can't be on the center cross because that was the darling son of God that died for our sin. But are you on the cross of rebellion? Or are you on the cross that cries out to Jesus? Have mercy upon me when you enter your kingdom. In this first section to my far right, there's a need in your life today, no matter what it is, would you look my direction and say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. God bless you. Section number two to my immediate right. Same question. There's a need in my life. The greatest need you'll ever have is a need to come to Jesus. And you would say by simply just looking at me and closing your eyes, when your head right back down, you'd say, there's a need in my life. Please pray for me. God bless. And to my immediate left, same question, section number three. You'd look this direction and you'd say, there's a need in my life today. Pray for me. God bless you. And this far section, section four, way over by the piano side, same question. There's a need in my life. And I want to trust Jesus to meet that need. Thank you. You can lift your heads. We're going to sing a verse of invitation. I'd love to invite you. If you're living close to the cross, 
and you'd be willing to pray with somebody if they come, would you come now and just stand here and let them know that this is not an empty place to come, that you're able, somebody loves you, somebody cares for you, and somebody's willing to pray with you when you come. As we sing, as God's people pray, what's the message that God sent to your heart today? Will you come? you a question. This virus thing is changing moment by moment by moment. I don't want to use it to scare you. That's not my intent. But life is fleeting past us moment by moment by moment. And one of these days you're going to draw your last breath. And will you stand before the Lord and say, but Lord, I heard Pastor Larry Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and I knew that you were drawing on my heart and I'm not real sure why. I had the best intentions in the world, Lord, of coming and being saved. And surely with those good intentions, you'll let me enter into your precious place called heaven. Without the blood of Jesus applied through your faith, you'll hear these words. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. It's time for Jesus to know us. It's time to submit our life to him and to trust him with everything that we have. Surely in the midst of what's going on in the world, we could quote the scripture. We know not what a day may bring forth, but thank God we know who holds tomorrow, don't we? Amen. One more verse, Brother Marty. I give you that verse, hoping and praying that you'll submit your life to Christ today. What cross are you going to be on when the Lord calls? Last verse, if no one comes. What cross are you going to be on? Cross of unbelief, cross of belief. Choice resides with you. appreciate you being here today. I trust and pray you experience something that will cause you to want to come back. We're praying for you if you're not saved. Prayers go up every day for you. I promise you they do. And we're just looking forward to the time that you say yes to Jesus. If I can help you in any way, if it means coming to your home in the wee hours of the night, I'm available to you. Would you consider that? Would you think about that? No service time tonight. Beginning now, from here on out, children's church and morning worship. And we'll, we'll keep you abreast of what's going on. Dave Dart, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?